Hello, everybody. I am very pleased to see you all here. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, which was dealt with by the treaties of peace and friendship, which were not actually about ceding land. Uh, I would also like to thank the Jules Leger Lecture Series in the Arts for funding this talk. This is the DHSI East Keynote. It's a four-day workshop where we've been talking about general artificial intelligence. So if you see tired faces around, their heads are full of three days of very big thoughts. Our last day will be tomorrow. My name is Laura Estel. I'm a professor of English and a Canada Research Chair in Digital Humanities here. And I'm one of the co-organizers of this event with Megan Landry from ACENET, Richard Cunningham from Acadia University, and Margaret Vale from the St. FX Libraries. This talk will be recorded and uploaded to YouTube after the fact, but we aren't going to record the Q&A session. I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Teresa Heffernan is a professor of English language and literature at St. Mary's University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where she teaches courses in literary theory, critical posthumanism, feminist theory, and the novel. Her current area of research is on how the field of robotics and artificial intelligence is shaped by fiction. She's been awarded a Visiting Public Humanities Faculty Fellowship at the Jackman Humanities Institute at the University of Toronto, and we had the pleasure of dragging her back to Nova Scotia for this talk. <laughs> Uh, she's also been a visiting fellow at CAPAS at the University of Heidelberg and the AI Lab at the University of Toronto's Centre for Ethics. Her books include an edited collection on cyborg futures, cross-disciplinary perspectives on artificial intelligence and robotics, veiled figures, women, modernity, and the specters of orientalism, and post-apocalyptic culture, modernism, postmodernism, and the 20th century novel. Her articles have appeared in journals such as AI and Society, Studies in the Novel, 18th Century Studies, Arab Journal for the Humanities, and Canadian Literature. She runs the website socialrobotfutures.com. Let's welcome Teresa. Thank you, thank you for coming, uh, and thank you Laura and Megan for inviting me, and to Aaron for running a really interesting workshop, um, and for all your contributions, I found it really interesting. I'm not a, a DH person, uh, but I have been working on like uh, robotics and artificial intelligence. Uh, so I just want to also start with an acknowledgement uh, that we are in the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq and that this talk was composed on the traditional land of many nations including the Mississaugas of the Credit uh, and the Chippewa. And I, I think that we have, uh, you know, when we're looking at kind of contemporary technology or the moment of technology like chat GPT or chatbots, um, you know, it's sometimes nice to kind of like bring a historical perspective. And I think about the way that indigenous people who have de developed like distinct languages, cultures and economies and ways of life over thousands of years you know, what we have to learn from them. And one Indigenous scholar I've learned a lot from is Robin Wall Kimmerer, uh, who has posited, we need more than policy change. We need a change in worldview from the fiction of human exceptionalism to the reality of our kinship and reciprocity with the living world. The earth asks us that we renounce a culture of endless taking so that the world can continue. So this talk is partly inspired by her words as it attempts to disrupt the prevalent uh, uh, framing of machines as human-like or living or animal-like. Um, and so for over a decade, my work has been focused on the conflation of fiction and science in the AI industry, which has not only distracted us from the real world impact of the technology, but has shut down the ethical potential of fiction. So let me begin, begin with uh, some of the most recent examples of industry profits making headline news with their, uh, with their pronouncements about the existential risk of AI. Two of the godfathers of the AI industry, Joshua Bencio and Jeffrey Hinton, uh, and Hinton sold his company to Google for $44 million in 2012. Um, are ringing the alarm bells about them taking control. Uh, 
Industry has like uh, the CEOs of OpenAI, Sam Altman, and Google's DeepMind, Demis Hassabas, concur. They all signed a short open letter in May 2023, published by the Center for AI Safety, which is a nonprofit backed by tech billionaires, warning us that a super intelligent AI might evolve, outsmart humans, and turn against us. Um, case includes the example of rogue AIs on its website, so that's the bottom quote. Um, we risk losing control over AIs as they become more capable. AIs could optimize flawed objectives, drift from their original goals, become power-seeking, resist shutdown, and engage in deception. Politicians from around the globe have invited Altman, a prepper who has stockpiled gas masks, guns, and gold, who's been funded by both Peter Thiel and Elon Musk, who dropped out of Stanford after two years of computer science to work on a social mobile application, and who paid 10,000 to have his brain embalmed on his deathbed in the hope, this is while he's still alive, in the hope that it can be uploaded into the computer, and he can, or a computer, and he can live forever. And they invited him to discuss the risks of human extinction by machines. So immortality and the end of the world, what has this apocalyptic rhetoric got to do with science? Not very much. With tech moguls, engineers, entrepreneurs, philosophy, and salesmen at the helm, these predictions about the future, backed by a great deal of money, have been met with an equal amount of skepticism and have been dismissed as the product of overinflated egos. Invoking the threat of autonomous machines, critics argue, deflects attention from a resource-intensive industry that, while lucrative for some, um, continues to inflict harm on society at large and fails to address a myriad of problems, including the concentration of wealth and power in the hands of a few, copyright violation, automated military weapons, Biased data, intrusive surveillance, ghost work, deep fakes, the, dis the dissemination of disinformation, and the environmental cost of the, of the industry, and I'll, I'll have more on that to come. And here are just a few books that speak, sorry, this is the tech lobby. So the, the tech lobby, this is the, the, the Center for AI and the Center for AI Policy. It's the funded, as I said, by tech billionaires. Um, but the big tech lobby is now one of the biggest lobbies in the state. So it out lobbies oil and pharmaceuticals. <laughs> um, so here are a few books that pro, uh, speak to this problem. Probably some of you are familiar with them, and I know Kate Crawford came up a couple of times. But um, So moreover, at the very heart of these claims of rogue machines is a mythic story about AI as an evolving autonomous entity, which begins in fiction, not science. In a 1951 paper, Intelligent Machinery, a Heretical Theory, Alan Turing, the father of AI, and they're all fathers, um, <laughs> concludes, quote, it seems probable that once the machine thinking method has started, it would not take long to outstrip our feeble powers. There would be no question of the machines dying, and they would be able to converse with each other to sharpen their wits. At some stage, therefore, we should have to expect the machines to take control in a way that is mentioned in Samuel Butler's Erewhon. Erewhon is published in 1872. It's a satiric novel that exposes the hypocrisies of the Victorian age. The title spelt backwards, say one letter, is nowhere. The section called The Book of Ma the Machines, uh, which is where uh, Turing, what Turing is referencing, playfully riffs on Darwin's theory of evolution. So Butler had just read Darwin's theory of evolution. Fearing that machines will evolve, reproduce, and take over, the Erewhonians destroy all the inventions of the past 271 years. The society spends several years in this absurd debate about a mangle, a board with rollers that had been long used to wring out water from clothes and to, to press and smooth laundry. 
Although ruled dangerous, as the mangle is older than the seemingly arbitrary date, cutoff date of 271 years, it is spared. In the end, uh, so in the end, they succeed in destroying all the event, all their inventions. In the preface to the second edition of the novel, Butler, responding to those who thought his novel was being critical of Darwin, protested that the debate, in fact, exemplified a specious misuse of analogy. In other words, he was not mocking Darwin, but a humorously applying the recent Darwin, recent for the time, Darwinian theory of evolution of living things to machines as an erroneous analogy, one that has the allure of truth but is utterly fallacious. While well, Butler employed literary tropes to critique Victorian society, Turing, knowing for, known for being overly literal, was seduced by the story of machines taking control. Turing also cited Butler's novel in, his, in the bibliography of his 1950s paper that famously set out to answer the question of whether a machine can think. The Turing test, uh, as it has come to be known, involves a judge, a computer, and a human all concealed from each other. The judge asks questions, and if the computer is able uh, to convince the judge, um, uh, that it is a human is considered to have human intelligence. In the first version of this test, however, it's between a man and a woman, where the man is trying to convince a judge he is a woman. So he gives fake answers about, for instance, his hairstyle. The computer, uh, the computer can also give fake answers when it's pretending to be a human. So what Turing called the machine thinking method is in fact a game that involves imitation and deception, not thinking. What happens when imitation, a model that continues to dominate the field of AI, is unleashed on the world at large as a replacement for thinking? When performance is made to substitute for understanding, when the fictions that inspire AI are presented as science, when deception outside the parameters of a game is rationalized, automated, and accelerated, when machine-generated text that cannot be held to account displaces humans who can be held responsible. This is the moment when evidence-based arguments facts and comprehension are overwhelmed by disinformation, biased algorithms, deep fakes, and toxic bots. In the 60s, uh, John, Irving John Good, who was a mathematician who was also at Bletchley Park with Turing, also referenced fiction when he speculated the quote that the first ultra-intelligent uh, machine is the last invention that man need ever make, provided that the machine is docile enough to tell us how to keep it under control. It's curious that this point is so seldom made outside of science fiction. It's sometimes worthwhile to take science fiction seriously. And I, yes, fiction should be taken seriously, but as Butler pointed out, not literally. Fiction differs from science as it embraces the complexity and specificity of the world. It's expansive, not reductive, which any good scientific model or algorithm must be. It makes no claims to averages or facts or precision, and instead foregrounds imaginative worlds, literary tropes and figurative language. When the, when the openness of fiction is shut down and it's read literally and mistaken for the real, it gets redeployed as myth in the tradition of Plato's noble lie that serves the interests of a ruling elite. In the latter part of the 20th century, the extroprians and the singulitarians were like Turing and Good before them, inspired by literal readings of fiction to pay, place their faith in machines. Male dominated, these groups practiced secret handshakes, adopted new sorts of names as a sort of rebirth, uh, used psychedelic drugs, they believed in cryogenics, resurrection, immortality, and held a religious-like faith in the transformative potential of technology. 
dismissed as cultish, these groups had a hard time gaining mainstream legitimacy. In 1994, there were only about 300 members of the Extropi Institute. In 1998, Nick Bostrom broke from the Estropians and founded the World Transhumanist Association. Seeking to gain recognition for transhumanism as a subject for serious scientific study and policy. In 2005, he further branded himself as an existential risk theorist and founded the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford. It just recently closed, like in the last, uh, in the last week or two. Funded by the futurist, um, the late James Martin, with more recent funding by Facebook, uh, and the co and co uh, founder, sorry, Dustin Muskovitz, who, who was the co founder of, um, uh, of Facebook, and Elon Musk. The Institute also hosted the transhumanist Anders Sandberg with backings from donors including Peter Thiel and Elon Musk. The Center, at the, study, the Center of Study of Existential Risk at Cambridge and the Future of Life Institute at MIT soon followed, lending academic legitimacy to the idea of transhumanism. The Singularity University, uh, co-founded by Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamandis, which despite its name is not a degree-granting institution, but a Silicon Valley company that sells expensive seminars and events, opened in June 2009 with the financial backing of corporations, including Google. If you, if you don't know, I, probably a lot of you do know about the singularity, uh, the, the idea of the singularity, but this is Ray Kurzweil, who actually is an AI engineer at Google, and he writes that within a few decades, machine intelligence will surpass human intelligence, leading to the singularity. Goes on to talk about um, the implications of biological and non-biological -bio intelligence in mortal software-based humans, and then the ultra-high levels of intelligence that expand <coughs> outward into the universe at the speed of light. Uh, he also takes a lot of supplements, Ray Kurzweil. <laughs> uh, so, um, in a short, in in short, and. Um, with the support and funding of tech billionaires, with lots of access to media, a relatively small group of men, sorry, with lots of group uh, access to media, a relatively small group of men have exerted a great deal of influence over discussions of AI. PR departments, well-connected journalists, tech magazines, and politicians all help to market AI. But do we all need to jump as soon as they push a new product? As Paris Marx writes, uh, quote, when a major tech company throws a new product into the world, it's all too common that people immediately assume it's something we must accept. We've seen a lot of that over the last year with generative AI. We're told it's here, so we just need to adjust to it. Instead of admitting, we do have the collective power to choose how it's used and if it should be used at all. While the AI industry mimics scientific argumentation, there are endless examples of it using fiction as support material. In contrast, for decades, climate science has been gathering empirical evidence about the impact of the fossil fuel industry, including plastics and petrochemicals. The scientific method involves a rigorous and reproducible testing of a hypothesis based on observations to find causal connections. And climate science has found that severe species loss, environmental degradation, and extreme weather can all be traced to the rapid industrialization and urbanization that's been enabled by the petroleum industry. Over the same decades that transhumanists were mobilizing, instead of investing in the low-hanging fruit of proven technologies to address this escalating ecological crisis, to name a few, bicycles, renewable energy, affordable public transportation, electric trains, heat pumps, tree planting, habitat restoration, repairable electronics, and environmentally responsible materials, 
Venture capital has financed high-tech sectors with considerable support from tech dollars, uh, the military, and heavily lobbied governments, and invested in resource-intensive super-intelligent machines from autonomous cars to robot soldiers. Billions of dollars have backed the AI industry with their fiction-fueled dreams of sentient robots, space colonies, uplifted animals, and downloaded brains, while science-based climate research has met resistance, deferral, and denial as the world burns. In the real world of technology, the environmental footprint of the AI industry and its digital infrastructure is enormous. Kate Crawford writes that, quote, one assessment suggests that ChatGPT, the chatbot created for, by OpenAI, is already consuming the energy of 33,000 homes. It's estimated that the search driven, it's estimated that a search driven by generative AI uses four to five times the energy of a conventional web search. Within years, large AI systems are likely to meet, need as much energy as entire nations. From data centers, uh, and Google opens one, I think, like about every three days. From data centers which require copious amounts of power and water, uh, to hazardous, a so this you can see, um, the typical data center uses about three to five million gallons of water a day. There are battles going on in, in parts of the uh, American West uh, between people, because the resource, the data centers are using drinking water, so there are like battles, some of the, some of the towns are suing. Uh, from data centers um, uh, to hazardous e-waste, e which makes up the world's fastest growing source of waste, much of it exported to Africa and China, to millions of kilometers of subsea internet cables, over half of which are owned by big tech companies that crisscross the oceans, to the rockets that launch, launch Starlight satellites, Starlink satellites, sorry, that themselves only last about 15 years and leave a toxic chemical trail when they punch back through the atmosphere and disintegrate. In lieu of taking responsibility, the uh, our industry argues it's not corporate owned technology that we should fear, but rogue machines. This is the place where science is displaced by myth propagated by an elite, spinning a narrative that represses its origins in fiction. Perpetuating the worst aspects of enlightenment philosophy, transhumanism subscribes to the myth of the autonomous liberal subject that understands itself as independent of the natural world, which is only there to be mastered and overcome. In his discussion of the sublime, for instance, Immanuel Kant, the 18th century philosopher, writes that the power of reason allows us to, quote, to judge ourselves independent of nature and reveals in us a superiority over nature. The legacy of that thinking has led global industries to teach, treat nature, on which economies depend, as an in, inert resource, a dead thing. Transhumanists and the AI industry, the culmination of centuries of colonialism, imperialism, and unprecedented industrial expansion, treat life, including humans, as a machine to be hacked, manipulated, and controlled. Fantasizing about birthing a digital intelligence and colonizing barren planets, Silicon Valley elites um, Tech elites exemplify the very thinking that has brought us to the brink of a global ecological collapse, even as they now imagine being manipulated and enslaved in turn. Hinton said in an interview, quote, if it gets much smarter than us, it will be very good at manipulation because it will have learned from us and there are very few examples of a more intelligent thing being controlled by a less intelligent thing. The AI industry fears that just as humans have endangered mountain gorillas and other animals, so a super intelligent machine would not hesitate to wipe out humans. Uh, 
Rather than acknowledging that trying to dominate nature has come at our own expense as we continue to pollute the planet and wipe out our only known biological companions in the universe at an alarming rate, Hinton views violence and manipulations as signs of advanced intelligence and projects these traits onto machines. Beyond purely cynical motives, like profit and power, the anxiety on the part of true believers that a malevolent AI will arise and wipe out humanity is a psychological displacement, an unconscious defense that substitutes a new object, autonomous machines, in place of a disavowed knowledge, the societal and ecological damage inflicted by the industry. In the latter part of this talk, I just want to point to the different understandings of AI in two of St uh, Stanley Kubrick's uh, film projects, one from 1968, 2001 A Space Odyssey, and one from 2001 uh, AI Artificial Intelligence. While working on 2001 in the 60s, Kubrick consulted Good, that was the Bletchley mathematician, and Marvin Minsky, the co-founder of MIT's AI lab, la laboratory, who was also predicting the evolution of superintelligent machines. Um, just, this is just a little aside. Here's Minsky. He's pictured here with the sex trafficker, Jeffrey Epstein, who would much later fund Minsky and the MIT uh, lab. Epstein was taken with the idea of transhumanism and eugenics, and he wanted to inseminate women with his sperm and have his brain and penis cryogenically frozen and brought back to life in the future. Back to, <laughs> Back to Kubrick, who would have known nothing of this and trusted and embraced these scientists' predictions. Hence the description of his character, the sentient computer Hell 9000. One of the things we were trying to convey in this part of the film is the reality of a world populated as ours soon will be by machine entities who have as much or more intelligence as human beings and who have the same emotional potentialities in their personalities as human beings. We wanted to stimulate people to think what it would be like to share a planet with such creatures. Most advanced computer theorists believe that once you have a computer which is more intelligent than a man and capable of learning by experience, it's inevitable that it will de develop an equivalent range of emotional reactions, fear, love, hate, envy, etc. Shaped by the speculation of the 1960s AI industry, the film opens with the famous scene of an ape encountering an ex extraterrestrial monolith throws a bone up in the air in triumph after he's used as a tool to beat up another ape. The next image is of an orbiting satellite four million late years later. Alien life, technological progress, and supermachine intelligence lie at the heart of this narrative, which is infused with a transhumanist faith in the mortal biological body, which will be cast off and replaced by a machine, and eventually intelligence will escape matter altogether, emerging as pure energy, as Kubrick enthused. When you think of a giant technological strides that man has made in, the few, in, in a few millennia, less than a microsecond in the chronology of the universe. Can you imagine the evolutionary development that much older life forms have taken? They may have progressed from biological species, which are fragile shells of the mind at best, into immortal machine entities, and then over innumerable eons, they could emerge from the chrysalis of matter transformed into the beings of pure energy and spirit. Their potentialities would be limitless and their intelligence ungraspable by humans. So this is Kubrick, it's about 1970 he said this. In the circle of fiction-inspired AI science, inspiring fiction that it is in turn inspired by, Hal continues to animate the AI industry serving as a holy grail. 
Over 50 years after the film's release, the question, quote, would it be possible to design a computer today that could reach out or outreach Hell's capabilities continues to motivate researchers. The MGM Studios marketing uh, campaign for the film emphasized the realism of the film, promising that, quote, everything in 2001, a space odyssey can happen within the next three decades, and most of the picture will happen by the beginning of the next millennium. We're past that. <laughs> uh, believing it would serve as a great advertisement for actual space technology, many corporations offered expertise and props in exchange for product placements in the film, including Honeywell, Boeing, General Dynamics, Bell Telephone, and General Electric. By the time Kubrick was working on AI, artificial intelligence in the 80s, the pre-moon landing dreams of space travel and intelligent cosmic machines had receded and computers had become a lucrative business. Scientific consensus about the green, uh, greenhouse, g gases ha greenhouse effect had solidified well, the grandiose promises of AI had not been realized, and the industry was heading into one of its winters. There's, a, there's always this cycle with AI, if you chart it from the, from the beginning. Um, in 1984, Minsky, the computer scientist whom Kubrick had consulted when he was working on 2001, was warning of the impending collapse of the field. Kubrick uh, uh, then again invited AI researchers to consult on this, his new project. Among them were Cynthia Briesel, director of the Personal Robots Group at the, at the Me Media Lab at MIT, who works on military-funded uh, emotional robots inspired by the fictional robots in Star Wars, and discusses AI in the tradition of Turing as like a child. And Hans Moravec, the transhumanist computer science and co-founder of the Institute of Robotics at Carnegie Mellon University. Kubrick had read Moravec's Mind Ch Children, The Future of Robot and Human Intelligence, which was published in 1988, about human brains uh, transferred to superintelligent, self-improving, immortal robots that could thrive in a post-biological universe long after humans and other life had disappeared. Based on many highly questionable premises, including that electronic constructs can be substituted for brain neurons and that consciousness can be downloaded into a computer, Moravec's book fantasizes about giving birth to machines that would transcend biology, nature, life, and the laws of the universe. Unlike 2001, where Kubrick treated the claims of computer scientists with their predictions of evolving machines seriously, AI situates these claims in fiction. Kubrick wanted to call the film Pinocchio after the 19th century children's story about a fairy with tur turquoise hair who helps transform a wooden puppet into a boy. Brian Aldiss, one of the invited scriptwriters, said, quote, Kubrick always wanted to include global warming, the eventual triumph of the robots, and one other factor, the blue fairy. It was the effing Pinocchio, it, the blue fairy. I worked with him for about six weeks, and I couldn't get rid of that blue fairy. If 2001 is inspired by the potential of space travel, immortality, and a disembodied cosmic consciousness, AI returns to a, 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 a plundered Earth and corporate power echoing the findings of climate scientists who had, since the 90s, been documenting the impending human-caused environmental collapse. The film's prologue imagines a future where melting ice caps and rising seas caused by greenhouse gases have already spelled the end of coastal cities from Amsterdam to New York to Venice. As millions are displaced by brutal weather and people in poorer countries starve, wealthier countries close their borders and restrict pregnancies. To address the much diminished late labor force, the elite build single-tasked androids that do not require food or sleep, nannies, chauffeurs, chefs, secretaries, secretary guards, and sex models. In a flooded New York City, Dr. Hobby, 
the head of Cybertronics, is seemingly oblivious to the irony of announcing to his employees that he is proud of, quote, how far they have come, and proposes they now explore the still untapped market, market of, of a mecha model that loves. Described as the essential economic link, the mecha keep the corporate machine churning and free mar market logic alive in the ruins of the world, and the AI industry perseveres even as the world succumbs to climate chaos. Like Mary Shelley's uh, grieving Dr. Frankenstein, who sets out to discover the secret of life and builds his man monster after the sudden death of his mother, Harvey embarks on his project to defeat death after he loses his son. His arrested grief, godlike aspirations, didn't God create Adam to love him, he queries. An unwavering belief in corporate capitalism lead him to dream of building a little mecca for, quote, a completely new market who will be, quote, a perfect child caught in a free fr free, uh, freeze frame, always loving, never ill, never changing. Emotionally arrested humans incapable of accepting death living in an uneasy relationship with a fact factory-built humanoid machines designed for service. David, a mecha child uh, programmed to love, is first adopted and then rejected and abandoned by its owners the couple Monica and Henry Swinton. Monica reads David the tale of Pinocchio, yet David, not understanding the difference between uh, fiction and reality, hopes that the blue fairy will turn him into a real boy. The Mecca insists against the protests of Monica that, quote, stories are real, only to discover in the course of his quest with his old model super toy, Teddy, that she was right, they are not. In the Vegas-like Rouge City, David and Gigolo Joe find Dr. No, a gimmicky holograph uh, information machine run by a corporation where fast food for thought is served up 24 hours a day. David asks the holograph how he can find a blue fairy. When a digital image of the blue fairy appears, David lurches at it, mistaking it for the real thing, asking, quote, but if a fairy tale is real, wouldn't it be a fact, a flat fact? At this point, Professor Hobby takes control of the answering machine, advertising his book, How Can a Robot Become Human? And promises to turn Mecca into Orga and fiction into fact and lures David back to his shiny corporate headquarters at the top of the Rockefeller Center, which looms out of the ruins of a desolate, uninhabitable Manhattan. There, David encounters another David, an exact replica of himself. In his first act of violence, David destroys the android that resembles him, insisting that David is unique and special. The professor who has made David in the image of his dead son tells the Mecca that he is his blue fairy. But a despondent David responds, I thought I was one of a kind. And the doctor offers glumly, my son was one of a kind. The Mecca then wanders into a nightmarish factory that produces identical David models, row on row, uh, upon, in boxes or hanging from hooks, awaiting shipment. The curtain is pulled back, and Dr. Hobby, like Dr. No, is exposed as a charlatan who is incapable of making David real, even as his corporation continues to rake him profits in, quote, the lost city in the sea at the end of the world. So just to conclude, the fairy tale of a robot who believes that stories are real is punctured by a dark world of corporate-driven mechanization that treats death as something that can be overcome and life as something that can, be trans that can be manufactured for profit, even in the face of an ecological crisis. The irony at the heart of the film revolves around a never-changing machine built by those who never learn to accept death that yearns to be mortal.
the very precarity, uniqueness, and irreplaceability of life on the planet, the very thing that the AI industry is trying to replicate and render immortal, is destroyed in the very attempt, throwing a wrench in the AI engineer's dreams of replacing Orga with Mecca. If the computer scientists Kubrick invited to consult on his film were convinced that they could make fiction come true, just as David believes that the blue fairy will make him human, the film is here to remind us that the blue fairy shatters, life without death is not life, and fiction is fiction. Thank you.